Test, test, test. Okay. <clears throat> we are here. Okay, if you would indicate in the chat box if you can hear me. Dr. Payton says yes. Dr. Jennings says yes. Dr. Danforth says yes. What about Dr. Thompson? Dr. Thompson, can you hear me? <clears throat> Dr. Thompson, are you there? Must be asleep. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. Just a very few here right at this moment. Okay, we are on a... on a topic here apparently not a whole lot of people are interested in but when you're trying to figure out uh, <clears throat> a couple of things may be causing problems with people and may come in kind of handy okay food preservation includes food processing practices which prevent the growth of microorganisms like yeast or other microorganisms Although some foods work by introducing benign bacteria or fungi to the food and slow the oxidation of fats that cause rancidity, food preservation may also include processes that inhibit visual deterioration, deterioration such as enzymatic browning reaction in apples after they are cut during food preparation. By preserving food, human communities are able to increase their food security through storage food storage and reduce food waste, uh, thus increasing the resilience of food systems, reducing their environmental impact of food production. Many processes designed to preserve food involve more than one food preservation method. Preserving fruit by turning it into jam, for example, <clears throat> involves boiling to, to reduce the fruit's uh, moisture content to kill bacteria, etc. Sugaring to prevent the regrowth, sealing within an airtight jar to prevent recontamination. Different food preservation methods have different impacts on the quality of the food and food systems. Some traditional methods of preserving food have been shown to have a lower energy input and carbon food print compared with modern methods. <clears throat> Some methods of food preservation are known to create carcinogens. In 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the World Health Organization, classified processed meat, i.e. meat that has undergone salting, curing, fermenting, smoking, as carcinogenic to humans. Interesting. <clears throat> New techniques of food preservation became available to the home chef from the dawn of agriculture until the Industrial Revolution. Bag of Prague powder number one, also known as curing salt or pink salt, is typically a combination of salt and sodium nitrite with pink color added to distinguish it from ordinary salt. The earliest form of curing was dehydration or drying, used as early as 12,000 BC. Smoking and salting techniques improve on the drying process and add antimicrobial agents that aid in preservation. Smoke deposits a number of pyrolysis products onto the 
food including phenols, syringol, guaiacol, and catechol. Salt accelerates the drying process. Osmosis also inhibits the growth of several common strains of bacteria. More recently, nitrites have been used to cure meat, contributing a characteristic pink color. Cooling preserves food by slowing down the growth and reproduction of microorganisms and the action of enzymes cause the food to rot. The introduction of commercial and domestic refrigerators drastically improved the diets of many Western world in the Western world by allowing foods such as fresh fruit, salads, and dairy products to be stored safely for longer periods, particularly during warm weather. Before the era of mechanical refrigeration, cooling for food storage occurred in the forms of root cellars, ice boxes, and rural people often did their own ice cutting, whereas town and city dwellers often relied on the ice to trade. Today, root cellaring remains popular among people who, various, who value various goals, including local food, heirloom crops, traditional home cooking techniques, family farming, for fragility, self-sufficient organic farming, and others. Freezing is one of the most common, commonly used processes, both commercially and domestically, for pre preserving a very wide range of foods, including prepared foods that would not have required freezing in their unprepared state. For example, potato waffles are stored in the freezer, but potatoes themselves require only a cool, dark place to ensure many months storage. Cold stores provide large volume, long-term storage for tr strategic food stocks held in case of national emergency in many countries. Boiling to liquid food items can kill any existing microbes. Milk and water often boiled to kill uh, any harmful microbes may pre uh, be present in them. Heating to temperatures which are sufficient to kill microorganisms inside the food is a method used with perpetual stews, milk is also boiled before storing to kill many microorganisms. Earliest cultures have used sugar as a preservative, and it was commonplace to store fruit and honey similar to pickled foods. Sugar cane was brought to Europe through the trade routes. In northern climates without sufficient sun to dry foods, preservatives are made by heating the fruit with sugar. Sugar tends to draw water from the microbes plasmolysis. This process leaves microbial cells dehydrated, thus killing them. In this way, the food will remain safe from my microbial spoilage. Sugar is used to preserve foods, fruits either in an antimicrobial syrup with fruits uh, such as apples, pears, peaches, apricots, plums, or in crystal crystallized form where the preserves Preserved material is cooked in sugar to the point of crystallization, and the resultant product is then stored dry. This method is used for the skins of citrus fruit or candied peel, angelica, ginger, also sugaring can be used in the production of jam and jelly. Okay, how many of you indicate over here in the uh, chat box knew that they use sugar? Basically, the use of sugar and salt was to dehydrate the microorganisms and kill them. How many of you knew that? We'll see that in the chat box over here. How many of you knew the use of sugar and salt was to dehydrate the microbes to kill them? Dr. Jennings, yes. David, yes. Donaldson, yes. That's good. Okay, you all knew that. Pickling is a method of pre preserving food in an edible antimicrobial liquid, and it can be broadly classified in two categories, chemical pickling and fermentation pickling. Chemical pickling, the food is placed in an edible liquid that inhibits or kills bacteria and other, other microorganisms. Typical pickling agents include brine, high in salt, vinegar, alcohol, vegetable oil. Many chemical pickling processes uh, also involve heating or boiling so that the food being preserved becomes saturated with the pickling agent. Common chemical, chemically pickled food, cucumbers, peppers, corned beef, herring, and eggs, as well as mixed vegetables such as uh, piccalilli. In fermentation, pickling bacteria in the 
liquid produce uh, organic acids for preservation as preservation acids agents, typically by a process that produces lactic acid through the presence of uh, lactobacillus. Fer fermented pickles include sauerkraut, uh, nukazuki, kimchi, and stirstroming. Lye or sodium hydroxide. Uh, lye makes food too alkaline for bacterial growth. Lye will saponify fats in the food, which will change its flavor and texture. Loop Fix uses lye in its preparation, as do some olive recipes. Modern recipes for century eggs call for lye. Canning involves cooking food, sealing it in sterilized cans or jars, and boiling the containers to kill or weaken any remaining bacteria as a form of sterilization. It was invented by the French confectioner Nicolas Appert. In 1806, this process was used by the French Navy to preserve meat, fruit, vegetables, even milk. Although Appert had discovered a new way of preservation, it wasn't understood until 1864 when Louis Pasteur found the relationship between microorganisms, food spoilage, and illness. Foods have varying degrees of natural protection against spoilage may require that the final step occur in a pressure cooker. High acid fruits like strawberries require no preservatives to can and only a short boiling cycle, whereas marginal vegetables such as carrots require longer boiling in addition of other acidic elements. Low acid foods such as vegetables and meats require pressure canning. Food preserved by canning or bottling is at immediate risk of spoilage once the can or bottle has been opened. Lack of quality control in the canning process may allow ingress of water or microorganisms. Most such failures are rapidly detected as decomposition within the can cause gas production. The can will swell or burst. However, there have been examples of poor manufacture, under-processing, poor hygiene, allowing contamination of canned food by the obligate anaerobe Clostridium botulinum, which produces an acute toxin within the food, leading to severe illness or death. This organ organism produces no gas or obvious taste, remains undetected by taste or smell. Its toxin is denatured by cooking, however. Cooking mushrooms handled poorly and then canned can support growth of Staphylococcus aureus, which produces toxin that is not destroyed by canning or subsequent reheating. Food may be preserved by cooking in a material that's solidifies to form a gel. Uh, such materials include gelatin, agar, maize flour, and arrowroot flour. Some foods naturally form a protein gel when cooked, such as eels and elvers, uh, <coughs> sapunclucid worms, which are a delicacy in Zayman, yum, in the Fujian province of the People's Republic of China. Jellied eels are a delicacy in the east end of Lon London where they're eaten with mashed potatoes. Can't wait to try that one. Potted meats and aspic, a gel made from gelatin and clarified meat broth, were a common way of serving meat offcuts in the UK until the 1950s. Many jugged meats are also jellied. A traditional British way of preserving meat, particularly shrimp, is by uh, setting it in a pot and sealing with a layer of fat. Also common is potted chicken liver. Jelling is one of the steps in producing traditional pâtés. Besides jelling of meat and seafood, widely known of jelling as fruit preservatives, which are preparations in fruits. Vegetables and sugar are often stored in glass jam jars and mason jars. Many varieties of fruit preservatives are made globally, including sweet fruit preservatives, such as those made from strawberry or apricot, savory preserves, such as those made from to tomatoes or squash. The ingredients used and how they are prepared uh, determine the different types of uh, preservatives. Jams, jellies, marmalades are all examples of different styles of fruit preservatives that vary based on the fruit used. In English, the word in plural form, preservatives, used to describe all types of jams and jellies. jellies. Remember, the marmalades uh, may have a lot of tyramines in them that can raise your blood pressure and uh, give you pain. Meat can be preserved by jugging, jugging in the process, stewing the meat, 
commonly called game or fish, is covered earthenware jug or casserole. The animal to be jugged is usually cut into pieces, placed in a tightly sealed jug with brine or gravy, and stewed. Red wine and or the animal's own blood is sometimes added to the cooking liquid. Jugging was a popular method of preserving meat up until the mid-20th century. Burial of food can preserve it due to a variety of factors. Lack of light, lack of oxygen, cool temperatures, pH level, or desiccants in the soil. Burial may be combined with other methods such as salting or fermentation. Most foods can be preserved in soil. It's very dry and salty, thus a desiccant such as sand or soil that is frozen. Many root vegetables are very resistant to spoilage, require no other preservation than storage in cool, dark conditions, for example, by burial on the ground, such as in storage clamp. Century eggs are traditionally created by placing eggs in alkaline mud or other alkaline substance, resulting in their in inorganic fermentation uh, through raised pH instead of spoiling. Fermentation preserves them and breaks down some of the complex, less flavorable proteins into fat and fats into simpler, more flavorable ones. Cabbage was traditionally buried during autumn in northern U.S. farms for preservation. Some methods keep it crispy while others produce sauerkraut. Similar processes used in the traditional pro pro production of kimchi. Sometimes meat is buried under conditions that cause preservation. If buried on hot coals or ashes, the heat can kill pathogens, the dry ash can desiccate, and the earth can block oxygen and further contamination. If buried where the earth is very cold, the earth acts like a refrigerator. Risa, India, it is practical to store rice by burying it underground. This method helps to store for three to six months during the dry season. Butter and similar substances have been preserved as a bog butter in Irish peat bogs for centuries. Meat can be preserved by salting it, cooking it nearly 100 degrees centigrade in some kind of fat such as lard or tallow, then storing it immersed in the, uh, in the fat. These preparations were popular in Europe before refrigerators became ubiquitous. Still proper, popular in France where they are called confit. Preparation uh, will keep longer if stored in cold cellar buried in cold ground. We're going to see some, some of the preservatives and some of the harm they can do to us also in a little bit here. Some foods such as many cheeses, wines, beers use specific microorganisms that combat spoilage from other less benign organisms. These microorganisms keep pathogens in check by creating an environment toxic for themselves and other microorganisms by producing acid or alcohol. Methods of fermentation include, but are not limited to, starter microorganisms, salt, hops, controlled usually cool temperatures, and controlled usually low level levels of oxygen. These methods are used to create the specific controlled conditions that will support the desirable organisms that produce food fit for use and consumption. Fermentation is microbial conversion of starch and sugars into alcohol. Not only can fermentation produce alcohol, it can also be valuable preservation technique. Fermentation can also make foods more nutritious and palatable. For example, drinking water in the Middle Ages was dangerous because it often contained pathogens that could spread, spread disease. When the water is made into beer, the boiling pro, uh, during the brewing process kills many bacteria in the water that can make people sick. Additionally, the water now has the nutrients from the barley and other ingredients. Microorganisms can also produce vitamins as they ferment. See, we knew that there was something good about the, the beer. It makes vitamins. There you go. Techniques of food preservation were developed in research laboratories for commercial applications. Pasteurization process for preservation of liquid food, and it was originally applied to combat the souring of young local wines. Today the process mainly applied to dairy products. In this method, milk is heated about 70 degrees for 15 to 30 seconds to kill the bacteria present in it and cooling quickly to 10 degrees centigrade to prevent the remaining bacteria from growing. How many of you knew that uh, pasteurization 
the cooking process only lasted 15 to 30 seconds. How many of you knew that? Let's see over here in the uh, chat box. Dr. Payton, yes. Dr. Thompson, yes. It's a rather short time. Dairy Country, yes. Dr. Jennings, yes. Okay. To prevent the remaining bacteria from growing, milk is then stored in sterilized bottles or pouches in cold places. This method was invented by Louis Pasteur, 1862. Vacuum packing. Stores food in a vacuum environment, usually airtight bag or bottle. Vacuum environment, environment strips bacteria of oxygen needed for survival. Vacuum packing is commonly used to storing nuts to reduce Loss of flavor from oxidation. Major drawback to vacuum packaging at the consistent consumer level is that vacuum sealing can de deform contents and rob certain foods such as cheese of its flavor. Now here we're getting into some specific artificial food additives, which probably a lot of you uh, that are viewing, uh, you know, want to know about for the purpose of this. Preservative food additives can be antimicrobial, which will inhibit the growth of bacteria or fungi, including mold or antioxidants, such as oxygen absorbers, which inhibit the oxidation of food constituents. Now, I went and looked up the MSDS. Some of these were pretty difficult. I had to look through four or five different uh, MSDS uh, sheets to find some of this. Common antimicrobial preservatives include calcium propionate. Potential health effects uh, inhalation may be harmful if inhaled, may cause respiratory tract uh, irritation. Sodium nitrate. Sodium nitrate is also poisonous large quantities, may cause a condition known as methemoglobinemia, which happens when nitrite in blood deactivates the hemoglobin in red blood cells. How many of you knew that sodium nitrite causes methemoglobinemia? How many of you knew that? Let's see it in the chat box over here. Methemoglobinemia. Nope. Yes. So kind of split half and half on this. Sodium nitrate. Medical studies indicate long-term consumption increased the risk of several illnesses such as stomach cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. How many of you knew that about sodium nitrite? Stomach cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Wow. And we got another thing for Alzheimer's on top of everything else that we looked at. Sulfites. Sulfur dioxide is particularly harmful to the respiratory system's overall health. Likewise, the air pollutant is detrimental to both eye and skin health. Sodium bisulfite, excessive heat, may liberate, liberate sulfur dioxide gas that is strongly irritating the eyes and mucous membrane. So heating the food liberates that, cause possible problem with the eyes and mucous membranes. How many of you knew that with the sodium bisulfite? Just heating it could cause problems to the eyes and the lungs and the nostrils. Okay, we're all learning stuff here. EDTA causes serious eye irritation, harmful if inhaled, may cause damage to organs through prolonged or repeated exposure. How many of you knew that about EDTA? Of course, EDTA chelation EDTA is found in a lot of frozen foods. How many of you knew that? If you look on your frozen foods, most of them have EDTA as a preservative in it. How many of you knew that? Frozen foods. Of course, we've talked about that before. Okay, anti antioxidants, including BHA. Harmful if swallowed causes skin irritation. Wow, that's right in the MSDS sheets. BHA, harmful if swallowed. How many of you knew that about BHA? Harmful if swallowed. Right in the MSDS sheet. 
Okay, how about BHT? Harmful if swallowed. Some phenol derivatives can cause damage to the digestive system if absorbed. Profuse sweating, thirst, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cyanosis, restless stupor, low blood pressure, gasping, abdominal pain, anemia, convulsions, coma, lung swelling can happen followed by pneumonia, BHT. How many of you know all that stuff about BHT? See that in the chat box here. That's quite a long list there, isn't it? One person knew some of those things. Okay, other preservatives include formaldehyde, usually in solution. Ingestion can cause severe abdominal pain by violent vomiting, headache, diarrhea, larger doses produce decreased body temperature, pain in the digestive tract, shallow respiration, weak irregular pulse, unconsciousness and death, methanol a component affects the optic nerve, may cause blindness. How many of you knew that formaldehyde were in some foodstuffs could cause that stuff as a preservative? How many of you knew that? Okay, one person knew it. Okay, glutaraldehyde was in sex that side. Ingestion, harmful if swallowed, can cause nausea, vomiting, gastrointestinal irritation, and burns to the mouth and throat. So some leftover insecticide in food. How many of you knew that about glutaraldehyde? See in the chat box over there. How many of you knew that about glutaraldehyde? Okay, ethanol and methyl, however you pronounce that. Ingestion may cause irritation in mucous membranes. There's also another approach of impregnating packaging materials, plastic films or other with antioxidants and antimicrobials such as uh, Butylated hydroxyzanitol, irritating to the eyes, respiratory system, and skin, so the stuff in the packaging can leach out. Uh, hydroxytoluene, harmful if swallowed, toxic to height. aquatic life, very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effect. Tocopherols. Tocopherols, now let's listen to that. That's vitamin E. Material may be irritating the mucous membranes and upper respiratory tract. How many of you knew about that about the tocopherols as preservatives? How many of you knew that about the tocopherols as preservatives? Irritating to mucous membranes and upper respiratory tract. Shocking, I agree. Hino Kitesiol, for research use only, not for human or veterinary use, yet is it is used by on packaging, which leaches through. Lysozyme, laboratory chemicals and industrial, and for professional use only. That's from egg whites. Wow. Nicen, to the best of our knowledge, the chemical, physical, and toxicological properties have not been thoroughly investigated. You see this in packaging and, and in uh, preservatives. How many of you recognize a couple of these things? Lysozyme and nicin. nicin. I remember seeing that in a lot of things. How many of you uh, recognize seeing those? Yeah, just the packaging can cause this from leaching through into us. Natamycin, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, delayed and immediate effects of exposure, gastrointestinal disturbances. That's in packaging. Kytosan, very hazardous in case of eye contact, irritant, hazardous in case of skin contact, ingestion, of inhalation, inflammation in the eye is characterized by wet, redness, watering, and itching. Chitosan, all of us have seen that. How many of you knew that stuff about chitosan? Come on, let's have a little, okay, no, no. Okay, we're all learning something. E-polylysine, 
can stop small intestine fat absorption through in inhibiting pancreatic lipase activities. So it can be the diet of therapy for obese patients. But guess what? This E. polylysine, because it does that, uh, can cause a problem with fat soluble vitamin absorption. Okay? Irradiation. Uh, can kill bacteria, moles, uh, in insect pesticides, reducing the ripening, ripening and spoiling of fruits and at higher doses induces sterility. Oh boy, hey. Technology can be pre compared to pasteurization, sometimes called cold pasteurization, as the product is not heated. Irradi irradiation may allow lower quality contaminated foods to be rendered marketable. National and international expert bodies have declared food irradiation as wholesome, like United Nations, World Health Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization, endorsed food irradiation. <clears throat> Consumers may have negative view of irradiated food based on the misconception that food is radioactive. In fact, irradiated food does not and cannot become radioactive. Activists have opposed food irradiation for other re reasons, arguing that irradiation can be used to sterilize contaminated food without resolving the underlying cause of the contamination. Uh, yeah, you can't trust the WHO. Probably not. International legislation on whether f food may be irradiated or not varies worldwide, from no radiation regulation to full ban. Approximately 500 million tons of food items are irradiated per year worldwide in over 40 countries. These are mainly spices and condiments. Ooh, spices and condiments, which we probably all use, with an increasing segment of fresh fruit irradiated by fruit fly quarantine. How many of you know where the irradiation comes from for this food irradiation? Wild guess. Let's see it in the text box over here. Wild guess. Where do they get the radiation to irradiate the food? Any guesses? I'm not seeing any guesses here. Plant waste. Exactly from nuclear plants. You got it. That's exactly where it is. They can't figure out where to, what to do with it. So guess what? They sell it to us. Uh, to use the irradiation in our food. Wow, okay. Pulsed electrical field or electroporation. PEF is a method for processing cells by means of brief pulse of a strong elect electric field holds potential as type of low temperature alternative pasteurization process for sterilizing food food products and PEF processing substances placed between two electrodes then the pulsed electronic field is used. Enlarges the pores of the cell membrane which kills the cells releasing their contents. PEF for food processing developing technology still being researched. Modified atmosphere. It's a way to preserve food by operating on the atmosphere around it. Salad crops are notoriously difficult to preserve now being packaged in sealed bags with atmosphere modified to reduce the oxygen or O2 concentration and increase the carbon dioxide concentration. There is concern that although salad vegetables retain their appearance and texture in such conditions, this method of preservation may not retain nutrients, especially vitamins. There are two methods for preserving, preserving dry grains with carbon dioxide. One is placing it block of dry ice in the bottom, filling the can with the grain. Another method is purging container from the bottom by gaseous carbon dioxide from a cylinder or bulk supply vessel. I wonder if they're taxing that CO2, you think? No, it's carbon dioxide not, dioxide, not monoxide. Carbon dioxide prevents insects and, depending on concentration, mold and oxidation from damaging the grain. Grain stored in this way can remain edible for approximately five years. Nitrogen gas at concentrations of 98% or higher is used to effectively kill insects in the grain through hypoxia. 
However, carbon dioxide have an, it has an advantage in this respect as it kills organization through hypercarbia and hypoxia, depending on concentration, but it requires concentrations of above 35% or so. This makes carbon dioxide preferable for fumigation situations where a hermetic seal cannot be maintained. Controlled atmospheric storage, uh, or CA, the storage is non-chemical process. Oxygen levels in the sealed rooms are reduced, usually by infusion of nitrogen gas from approximately 21% in the air we breathe to 1% or 2%. Uh, carbon monoxide is added to keep meat from turning brown. Okay, very good. Uh, temperatures are kept at a constant humidity uh, a temperature of 0 to 2 degrees Celsius, Celsius or 32 to 36 de degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Humidity is maintained at 95% and carbon dioxide levels are also controlled. Exact conditions in the rooms are met according to the apple variety. Researchers develop specific regimens for which is best. For example, Washington after apples are grown has enough warehouse storage for 181 million boxes of fruit, according to a report done in 97 managers for Washington State Department of Agriculture Plant Services. Storage capacity shows 67% of that space as CA storage, which is uh, 121 million and 8,000 boxes of apples. Airtight storage of grains, sometimes called hermetic storage, relies on respiration of grain, insects, and fungi that can modify the enclosed atmosphere sufficiently to control insect pests. This is a method of great antiquity as well as having modern equivalents. The success of the method relies on having the correct Mix of ceiling, grain moisture, and temperature. A patented response uses fuel cells to exhaust and automatically maintain the exhaustion of oxygen in a shipping container containing, for example, fresh fish. Non-thermal non plasma. This process subjects the surface of food to a flame of ionizing gas molecules like helium or nitrogen this caused microorganisms to die off on the surface. High pressure food preservation or pascalization refers to the use of a food preserve, preservation technique that makes uh, high pressure, makes use of high pressure pressed inside a vessel exerting 70,000 pounds per square inch or more food can be processed so it retains its fresh appearance flavor, texture, and nutrients while disabling harmful microorganisms and slowing spoilage. By 2005, the process was being used for products ranging from orange juice, guacamole, uh, to guacamole to deli meats, widely sold. Biopreservation is the use of natural or controlled microbiota or antimicrobials as a way of preserving food and extending its shelf life. Beneficial bacteria or fer uh, fermentation products produced by these bacteria are used in biopreservation to control spoilage, render pathogens inactive in food. This benign ec ecological approach is gaining increased attention. Of special interest are lactic acid bacteria, or LAB, have uh, antagonistic pro properties that make them particularly useful as biopreservatives. Uh, when can, uh, they compete for nutrients. Their metabolites often include active antimicrobials such as lactic acid, acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and uh, peptide bacterio bacteria. And some labs produce the antimicrobial nicin, which we talked about before, which is particularly effective preservatives. These days, lab bacteriosins are used as an integral part of hurdle technology. Using them in combination with other, other preservative techniques can effectively control spoilage bacteria and other pathogens, can inhibit the activities of wide spectrum of organisms, including inherently resistive gram-negative bacteria. Hurdle technology is method of ensuring, ensuring that pathogen food products can be eliminated or controlled by combining more than one approach. 
These approaches can be thought of as hurdles the pathogen has to overcome if it is to remain active in the food. The right combination of hurdles can ensure all pathogens are eliminated or rendered harmless in the final product. Hurdle technology has been defined by Listener as an intelligent combination of hurdles that secures microbial safety and stability as well as the organoleptic and nutritional quality and the economic viability of food products. The organoleptic quality of the food refers to its sensory properties, that, that is, its look, taste, smell, and texture. Examples of hurdles in a food system are high temperature during processing, low temperature during storage, increasing the acidity, lowering the water activity or redox potential, presence of preservatives or biopreservatives, according to the type of pathogens, how risky they are. The intensity of hurdles can be adjusted individually to meet consumer preference preferences in an economical way without sacrificing the safety of the product. Principal hurdles used for food preservation after Listener 1995. High temperature, low temperature, reduced water activity, increased acidity, reduced redox potential, biopreservatives, other preservatives. Shelf life. This pack of dice pork says display until 7. It, okay, so diced pork has that, uh, for example. It's the length of time that a commodity may be stored without becoming unfit for use, consumption, or sale. In other words, it might refer to whether a commodity should no longer be on a pantry shelf unfit for use or just no longer on a super, supermarket shelf unfit for sale, but not yet un, unfit for use. So shelf life is... Uh, uh, how long it can be on the super, supermarket shelf, but it not not necessarily is yet un, unuse, uh, unfit for use. It applies to cosmetics, foods, beverages, medical devices, medicines, explosives, pharmaceutical drugs, chemicals, tires, batteries, many other perishable items. In some regions, an advisory best before mandatory use by or freshness state is required on packaged perishable foods. This concept of expiration date is related but legally distinct in some jurisdictions. Shelf life, life is recommended maximum time for which products or fresh harvested produce can be stored during which the defined quality of specified proportion of the goods remains acceptable under expected or specified conditions of distribution, storage, and display. According to the USDA, canned foods are safe indefinitely as long as they are not exposed to freezing temperatures or temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If the cans look okay, they are safe to use. Discard cans that are dented, rusted, or swollen. High acid canned foods such as tomatoes and fruits will keep their best quality for 12 to 18 months. Low acid canned foods, meats, or vegetables for 2 to 5 years. Sell-by date is a less ambiguous term for what is often referred to as an expiration date. Most food is still edible after the expiration date. A product that is past its shelf life might still be safe, but quality is no longer guaranteed. In most food stores, waste is minimized by using stock rotation, which involves moving the products with the earliest sell-by sell date from the work warehouse to the sales area, then to the front of the shelf, so that most shoppers will pick them up first, thus they are likely to be sold before the end of their shelf life. So if you're looking for a longer shelf life, grab the ones at the back of the shelf. Some stores can be fine for selling out-of-date products. Most, if not all, would have to mark such products down as wasted, resulting in financial loss. Shelf life depends on the degradation mechanism of the specific product. Most can be influenced by several factors. Exposure to light, heat, moisture, transmission of gases, mechanical stresses, contamination by things such as microorganisms. Product quality is often mathematically modeled around a parameter, concentration of a chemical compound, microbiologic index, or moisture, moisture content. <clears throat> For some foods, health issues are important, in determining shelf life. Bacterial contaminants are ubiquitous and foods left unused too long 
will often be contaminated by substantial amounts of bacterial colonies and become dangerous to eat, leading to food poisoning. However, shelf life alone is not an accurate indicator of how long food can be safely stored. For example, pasteurized milk can remain fresh for five days after its sell-by date, if it is refrigerated properly. However, improper storage of milk may result in bacterial contamination or spoilage before the expiration date. Expiration date of pharmaceuticals specifies the date of the manufacturer guarantees the full potency and safety of a drug. Most medications continue to be effective and safe for a time after the expiration date. Rare exception is a case of renal tubular acidosis reportedly caused by expired tetracycline. A study conducted by the U.S. Food uh, FDA covered over 100 drugs prescription over the counter. The study showed that about 90% of them were safe and effective for as long as 15 years past their expiration dates. Hmm, okay. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that about drugs? Good for as long as 15 years after their expiration date. How many of you believe that? Absolutely. Yes. No. No. I got my doubts on that one. Joel Davis, former FDA expiration date compliance chief, said that with a handful of exceptions, noticeably nitroglycerin, insulin, some liquid antibiotics, most expired drugs are probably effective. Shelf life is not significantly studied during drug development and drug manufacturers have economic and liability incentives to uh, specify shorter shelf lives so that consumers are encouraged to discard or repurchase pro products. One major exception is the Shelf Life Extension Program, or SLEP, of the U.S. Department of Defense, or the DOD, which commissioned a major study of drug, drug efficacy from the FDA started, starting in the mid-1980s. One criticism is the U.S. Food and Drug Administration refused to issue guidelines based on SLEP research for normal marketing of pharmaceuticals, even though the FDA performed the study. Well, imagine that uh, two government agencies uh, not wanting to cooperate. The SLEP and FDA signed a memorandum that scientific data would not be shared with the public. Wow. Public health departments, other government agencies, and drug manufacturers. How many of you knew that? So they knew this stuff, but they signed something saying that they wouldn't tell the public or other government agencies about it. How about that? How many of you knew that? Isn't that crazy? Government lied, sick bastards. Yeah, how about that? State and local programs are not permitted to participate. The failure to share data has caused foreign governments to refuse donations of expired medications. Good for them. One exception occurred during the 2010 swine flu epidemic when the FDA authorized expired Tamiflu based on SLEP data. Uh, the SLEP discovered that drugs such as Cipro remained effective nine years after their shelf life and as a cost-saving measure, the U.S. military routinely uses a wide range of SLEP-tested products past their official shelf life if drugs have been stored properly. Package testing, heat sealing for evaluation of shelf life of lettuce preservatives and antioxidants may be incorporated into some food and drug products to extend their shelf life. Uh, some companies uh, use induction sealing and vacuum oxygen barrier pouches to assist in the extension of shelf life of their products where oxygen caused the loss. The DOD Shelf Life Program designs Defined shelf life is total period of time beginning with the date of manufacture, date of cure for elastomeric rubber products only, the date of assembly or date of pack subsistence only, and terminated by the date which an item must be used or expiration date or subjected to inspection, test, restoration, or disposal action, or after inspection or lab laboratory test restorative action that an item may be remain in the combined wholesale or food 
including food manufacturing and retail storage systems, still be suitable for issue uh, by the end user. Shelf life is not to be confused with service life, defined as a general term used to quantify the average or standard life expectancy of an item or equipment while in use. When a shelf life item is unpacked and introduced to mission requirements, installed into an intended application and really left in storage, placed in pre-expended bins or held as bench stock, shelf, shelf life management stops and service life begins. Shelf life is often specified in conjunction with a spe specific product pass package and distribution system. For example, MRE field ration is designed to have a shelf life of three years at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and six months at 100 degrees. Temperature control. Nearly all chemical reactions can occur at normal temperatures, although different reactions proceed at different rates. However, most reactions are accelerated by high temperatures. Degradation of foods and pharmaceuticals is no exception. The same applies to breakdown of many chemical explosives into more unstable compounds. Nitroglycerin is notorious. Old explosives are thus more dangerous uh, than more recently manufactured explosives. Rubber products also degrade as sulfur bonds uh, induced during vulcanization reverse. This is why old rubber bands and other rubber products soften and get crispy, lose their elasticity as they age. So look to see your uh, manufacture date on your tires before you buy them. The usually quoted rule of thumb is that chemical reactions double the rate for each uh, temperature increase of 10 degrees uh, centigrade or 18 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit because activation energy barriers are more easily surmounted at higher temperatures. However, as with many rules of thumb, there are many caveats and exceptions. The rule works best for reactions with activation energy values around eight, uh, 50 kilojoules per mole. Many of these are important at the usual temperatures we encounter. It's often applied to shelf life estimations, sometimes wrongly. There is a widespread impression, for instance, in industry that triple time can be simulated in practice by increasing the temperature by 27 degrees Fahrenheit, e.g. storing the product one, one month at 95 degrees Fahrenheit simulates three months at uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This is mathematically incorrect. If the rule is precisely accurate, required temperature increase would be about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And in any case, the rule is only a rough approximation and cannot always be relied on. Same is true up to a point of the chemical reactions of living things. They are usually catalyzed by enzymes, which change reaction rates with no variation in catalytic action. The rule of thumb is still mostly applicable in the case of bacteria and fungi. The reactions needed to feed and reproduce speed uh, up at higher temperatures up to one point that the proteins uh, and other compounds, their cells themselves begin to break down or denature so, so quickly that they cannot be replaced. This is why high temperatures kill bacteria and other microorganisms. Tissue breakdown reactions reach such rates that they cannot be compensated for and the cell dies. On the other hand, elevated temperatures Short of these result in increased growth and reproduction if the organism is harmful, perhaps to dangerous levels. Just temperature increases speed up reactions, temperature decreases reduce them. Therefore, to make explosives stable for long periods, to keep rubber bands springy or to force bacteria to slow down their growth, they can be cooled. This is why shelf life is generally extended by temperature control. Refrigeration, insulated shipping containers, controlled cold chain, etc. Why some medicines and foods must be refrigerated. Since such storing of such goods is temporal in nature and shelf life is dependent on the temperature controlled the environment, they are also referred to as cargo, even when in special storage to emphasize the inherent time temperature sensitivity matrix. Temperature data loggers and time temperature indicators can re uh, record the temperature history of a shipment to help estimate the remaining shelf life according to USDA. Foods kept frozen continuously are safe indefinitely. Packaging. Passive barrier packaging can help control 
or extend shelf life by blocking transmission of deleterious substances like moisture or oxygen across the barrier. Active pack packaging, on the other hand, employs the use of substances that scavenge, capture, or otherwise render har harmless deleterious substances when moisture content is a mechanism for product degradation. Packaging with low moisture vapor transmission rate and use of desiccants help keep the moisture in the package within acceptable limits. And oxid oxidation is primary con primary concern. Packaging with a low oxygen transmission rate and use of oxygen absorbers can help extend the shelf life. Produ produce and other products with respiration often require packaging with controlled barrier properties. Use of a modified atmosphere in the package can extend the shelf life uh, for some products. According to the UK Waste and Resources uh, Action Program, 33% of all food produce produced is wasted along the cold chain or by the consumer. Wow, 33%. Now, I'd heard 25% continuous, uh, at least in the United States. How many of you knew about the 33% food waste? <clears throat> Let's see in the, uh, in the box over here. I'd heard 25, but not 33. That's a pretty high rate. At the same time, a large number of people get sick every year due to spoiled food. According to WHO and CDC, every year in the U.S. there are 76 million foodborne illnesses leading to 325,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths. <clears throat> According to former U.K. Minister Hillary Benn, the use of by date and cell dates or old technologies that are outdated should re be replaced by other solutions or disposed of altogether. UK government's Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs revised guidance in 2011 to exclude the use of cell by dates. Guidance was prepared in consultation with the food industry, consumer groups, regulators, waste and resources action program. It aims to reduce the annual uh, uh, 12 billion of wasted supermarket food. Canada, best, a best before date on the bottom of box in Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency produces a guide to food labeling and advertising which sets out a durable life date. The authority for producing the guide comes from Food and Drugs Act. The guide sets out what items must be labeled and the format of the date. The month and day must be included in and the year, if it is felt necessary, must be in the format format of year, month, day. However, there is no requirement that the year be in four digits. The EU food quality dates are governed by the EU uh, 2011 on the pr provision food information to consumers. In Ger Germany, one differentiates between the MHD, roughly minimum shelf life, and... Uh, Versmustiden, with however you say that, which is more in line with the common expiry date. Products that spoil quickly, such as minced meat, have to be given in a verbostatum, are barred from sale upon expiry. Other products, which is set forth by the individual producer's said product, do not bar the product from being sold on the past uh, past the date determined. Products with uh, an expired M. HD may be sold if the seller is satisfied that the goods are in perfect condition. Accordingly, it follows the customer is not entitled to compensation if he unintentionally acquires a product with an expired shelf life, provided the product can still be regarded as faultless. Neither the MHD nor the Vermistatum uh, provide legal rights if a product is no longer fit for consumption before the indicated date and the manufacturer can prove the credibility of these claims. The MHD has been criticized for, for possibly causing food waste. For example, the then minister Christian Schmidt complained that many still edible foods with an expired MHD would be thrown away by consumers who would misunderstand the MHD as an expiration date. Hong Kong prepackaged food from the micro microbiological point of view is highly perishable, therefore likely after a short period to constitute an immediate danger to human health, are required to use the use-by label instead of best-before label. 
Examples include pasteurized fresh milk, a packed egg and ham sandwiches, etc. Dates are presented with the uh, day, month, year format. United Kingdom, according to the Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, the dates may be in the day, month, day, year format, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. United States sale of expired food products per se is lightly regulated in the U.S. Some states restrict or forbid the sale of expired products, require expiration dates on all perishable products or both, while other states do not. However, the sale of contaminated food is generally illegal, may result in product liability lit litigation if consumption of the food results in injury. After losing a lawsuit, pharmacy chain C CVS implemented a system caused its registers uh, to recognize expired products and avert their sale. Voluntary industry guidelines announced 2017 from Grocery Manufacturers Association Food Marketing Institute recommended using only best if used by or used by to avoid confusion leads to food waste. In 2019, the Food and Drug Administration urged food manufacturers to adopt the voluntary standards. The FDA, which regulates Packaged foods and drugs only requires used by or expiration date on the infant formula and some baby foods because formula must contain a certain quantity of each nutrient as described on the label. If formula is stored too long, it may use, lose its nutritional value. USDA regulates fresh multri, poultry and meats, only requires labeling of the date when the poultry is packed. However, many manufacturers also voluntarily add sell by or use by dates. DOD shelf life program operates under the DOD regulation uh, and it goes into the federal system on the DOD there. Beer freshness date. Freshness date is the date used in the American brewing industry to indicate whether the date the beer was bottled or the date before which the beer sh should be consumed. Beer is perishable. It can be affected by light, air, or the action of bacteria. Although beer is not legally mandated in the United States to have a shelf life, freshness dates serve much the same purpose and are being used as a marketing tool. General Brewing Company of San Francisco marketed their Lucky Lager beers age dated as early as 1935. They stamped the date on uh, each can lid to indicate the beer was brewed before that date. And so they were, they were kind of the first ones to do that. And it goes into that there concept of shelf life applied to other products uh, besides food and drugs such as gasoline and glues and etc. Expiration date or expiry date is a previously determined date after which something should no longer be used either by operation of law or exceeding the anticipated shelf life for perishable goods. Expiration dates are applied to selected food products and to some other manufactured products like Infant car seats where the age of the product may impact its safe use. Arbitrary expiration dates are also commonly applied by companies, product coupons, promotional fares, credit cards, etc. So your credit card will explode if you don't use it by a certain date, right? Tag sealing a bag of hot dog buns displays a best before date of February 29, for example. Best before or best by dates on a wide range of frozen, dried, tinned, or other foods. These dates are only advisory and refer to the quality of the product. In contrast with use of uh, use by dates, which indicate that the product may longer be safe to consume after the specified date. Food kept after the best before date will not necessarily be harmful, but begin to lose its optimum flavor and texture. Eggs are a special case since they may contain salmonella, which multiplies over time. Therefore, should be eaten before the best before date, which in the USA is a maximum 45 days after the eggs are packed. How many of you knew that? Eggs should be used within 45 days after the eggs are packed. Let's see that in the chat box over there. Within 45 days after the eggs are packed. How many of you knew that? Let's see that in the chat box. Are you all awake here? Here we go. We got a couple answers coming. I thought it was 21. Okay. 
Sometimes the packaging process involves using pre-printed printed labels, making it impractical to write the best before date in a clearly uh, visible location. In this case, wording like base before, see bottom, or best before, see lid. Used by a foil milk bottle top in the UK dis displays a used by date of 26 December, for example. Generally, foods that have a used by date written on the packaging must not be eaten after the specified date. Opening date. Opening date is the use of date stamped on the package of a food product to determine how long to display the product for sale. Benefits to the consumer by ensuring that the product is of best quality uh, when sold. An open date does not supersede a use by date. And you have uh, the Canadian. You have non-food items. Now the FDA in the United States notes that a principle of U.S. food law is that foods in U.S. commerce must be wholesome and fit for consumption. However, the agency also states, with the exception of infant formula, the laws that Food and Drug Administration uh, administers do not preclude the sale of food is past the expiration date indicated on the label. FDA does not require food firms to place expired by or used by or best before dates on food products entirely at the discretion of the manufacturer. Okay. According to USDA, canned foods are safe indefinitely as long as they are not exposed to freezing temperatures or temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The cans look okay. They're safe to use. Sell-by date is less ambiguous, ambiguous and expiration date. There you go. Okay. Okay. Now, Okay, anybody have any questions on anything we went over? We went over 9 o'clock by a few minutes there. Any questions on any of that? I think we all learned a couple of things on that. Okay. Now we're going to go to evidence-based medicine. Uh, some of you may not know what evidence-based medicine is, although it's referred to all the time that we ought to have it. So we have this document available. It's taken right off the ACA website. And uh, uh, also that includes uh, the British Medical Journal, Evidence-Based Medicine Best Practices. Basically what it is, is research combined by uh, what you've observed in your own practice. So if you would like a copy of that, you can request that by uh, pushing a button, or you may contact me directly uh, with my email, which I will put that up on here in a minute. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we have videos available uh, for all of parts one through three, and hopefully I'm going to finish the first draft of the part four tomorrow, which I think I will. Uh, basically, uh, what that means is I will have the first draft and I'm going to check all through it to make sure everything is proper, and then we will take it out. So we we're just right at the end of it. Anyway, parts one, two, and three are available. All of this is uh, available for you to look at. Here are all sorts of symptoms from part one, which is basically all reflexes with minor scar tissue uh, in the skin. You can get amazing things without working on that dense scar tissue. All of this is well documented in the literature there's nothing like it uh, else that's being taught. Uh, part two is dense scar tissue outside the joints. Uh, the end, uh, the beginning of this actually is uh, an extension of part one, where we show you how to easily, within 10 minutes, test over 200 muscles in the body and then very lightly touch one muscle like this and bang, all the muscles come strong immediately. This keeps you from having to go from muscle to muscle like applied kinesiology. 
The only exception is if there's a lot of atrophy in a given muscle, of course, that will take longer. Second thing that we teach is to palpate the whole body and find one spot, lightly touch it like that, and bang, no pain to palpation. The only exception being uh, extremely explain, uh, inflamed areas, which will drop by half immediately and then take a little longer to go down simply because it's so inflamed. So this saves you from having to go from trigger point to trigger point uh, and being very painful about it. Uh, the second thing that we teach is how to reduce rehab time to about a fourth of normal. Then we show you how to address scar tissue uh, much quicker uh, than you would guess. Uh, for example, ART states in their seminars they take uh, four to six visits to totally eliminate scar tissue from a given muscle. Uh, uh, Graston six to ten with their expensive tools. Uh, transverse friction massage, right in Syriac's manual, 10 to 20. And those are very time intensive, a lot of exertion on your part. Uh, a lot of times uh, they're very painful to the patient and uh, leave bruising. Ours takes seconds and usually only one visit with very little exertion on your part. So it's a whole lot quicker and it helps a lot of conditions which we have outlined right here. Now it takes care of dense scar tissue outside the joint. Therefore you have uh, part three dense scar tissue inside the joint. Now the first thing that we teach you there is how to uh, within seconds locate a segment and lightly tap it like this and immediately release uh, the paraspinal tension and pain. This is designed to get rid of the compensatory subluxations. Uh, and you know, it's very eye-opening. And then you can go to the primary subluxations. So we teach adjusting, manipulation, mobilization of the extremities, the cranials, and the vertebra. And I've taken care of uh, over 40,000 patients from all 50 states and 97 countries, over 3,000 of which were upper level athletes, over 800 of which were professional. I've taken care of 12 professional sports teams uh, and three of those were foreign national teams. I was the first chiropractor invited to treat players at the NFL Run for Daylight Fastest Man competition. Take care of all of these joint problems and you, believe it or not, we can show you how to get rid of esophageal reflex and hiatal hernia with an osseous adjustment, entirely predictable. And when you adjust the stomach down like pie kinesiology, that's taking care of a symptom which have, it has its place, but I want to keep it from coming back. We show you how to adjust the knee to get rid of dementias and help sh short-term memory also. Very eye-opening. All of these conditions. Uh, we show you how to get autistic children to calm down their demeanor, start speaking words and sentences, and go back into normal classes with normal children. Uh, very eye-opening. It only takes about three minutes, very light force. Uh, very eye-opening. Now, the first three seminars takes care of the nervous system. Nervous system controls the secretory and excretory events of the body. Uh, therefore, when you're using parts one, two, and three, a lot of review, um, uh, resistant cases that have not been responding to uh, your nutritional intervention will automatically clear up because it was actually a nervous system issue, which you didn't recognize, didn't know how to recognize, didn't know how to treat. So that makes a huge difference there. Therefore, the part four are purely body chemistry issues. Now, I hold a Master of Science in Biology emphasizing human nutrition. That was an in-class uh, thing. I'm a Master Herbologist. I've uh, been a member of six nutritional, and medical, and scientific boards on uh, major uh, nutritional companies. <coughs> I've also performed over 15,000 nutritional assessments. Now, I teach things different, and we teach 
you how to take care of almost any type of nutritional issue and hormonal issue, enzymatic issue, uh, di uh, digestion, absorption, transport, uh, absorption into the cell, into the nuclear, nuclear and uh, um, microsomal uh, uh, Golly, uh, the energy system of the body, uh, those those seals, and how how to get the chemicals to break down. Boy, I'm I'm losing that on that name there. Sorry about that. How to get the body uh, to break the substances down to their last constituents so they can properly uh, be secreted and excreted out of the system. Now, when it hangs up and it doesn't break down all the way, that's when inflammation occurs. We also teach you chemical pathways and negative feedback loops without which we could not live in this body. Just for example, uh, we're taught that when you have trouble uh, with electrolytes, we give people ele electrolytes. Well, that's just one part of it. So what's, what controls electrolytes in the body? Androgens. What controls the androgens? Progesterone. What controls progesterone? Pregnenolone. What controls pregnenolone? Through a negative feedback loop, estrogen, but also vitamin D. Okay. Now, when pregnenolone presents a problem, then it can't make progesterone or DHEA, and then those can't make testosterone. So therefore, we can show you how to take somebody with low or zero T and uh, get them back up to the normal testosterone level in a manner of a couple of weeks. Another thing that uh, progesterone controls is uh, cortisol, which controls swelling and inflammation. So therefore, you may have a problem with progesterone and have swelling and inflammation. So there are all sorts of things that happen with this. Now, because you didn't know about this before, uh, these are all uh, pre-publication at $250 for a year's viewing. And the first three are out. Uh, the fourth one is about to come out. So basically I'm going to type in here um, drbbrk at hotmail.com and also my phone number 469 995-9907 and you can order these you know the next couple of days I will still give you the 250 uh, for, for pre-publication uh, but once they're all out then probably this pre-publication is going to go away and it's going to be $500 for a year's viewing well worth it we make it very user friendly because we have timestamps I encourage you to watch them all the way through and things that you have trouble with. You click on the timestamp and it'll take you right through uh, to where it is. And you can watch it as many times as you want until it really sinks in. Okay. So they're very user friendly here. So I would encourage you to do that. Now, finally, we have a mentoring program. And here are testimonials of. People have gone through the mentoring or still in it. Uh, it's what I've been searching for my entire career. Combines top-notch, unique clinical knowledge and procedures down with business strategies, test of time. And this fellow is up in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. B's mentoring program second to none. He's from California. Mentoring program is the best investment I ever made. And he is in Ohio. Since mentor, mentoring uh, members, mentorship, I've seen several improvements in my practice, getting desired results. This fellow is in Chicago, and he upped his practice so well he decided to move to his dream home, which is in Florida. So he decided to start up a practice there with the knowledge we gave him, and he's starting out with a really big boom down there. I wasn't sure if I needed a mentor. So I thought my business was very successful, and it was. Uh, but we did a lot of stuff that he had no idea about. And this fellow is in Texas. 
can't believe how much my practice has changed and grown since mentoring with Dr. Bonebreak. This gentleman is in Texas. I've been in private practice for 23 years, own operate a successful chiropractic sports medicine in Austin. Dr. Bonebreak mentoring is no fluff, no cookie cutter, no one size fits all approach. He's in Austin. It's Dr. Danforth. He's in uh, Lubbock, Texas. He's gotten a lot of improvement. I've been in practice 25 years, seen my fair share of seminars. This fellow is down in Houston also. They're all well pleased with it. Uh, basically what I look at myself for in any instance giving seminars uh, and mentoring, I'm to act as a shortcut. I've taken over a million and a half dollars worth of seminars and I've been in practice for 41 years. Uh, my job is to make things easy for you, get you where you want to go quicker. I've uh, also been a member of uh, pra uh, practice management, practice consulting, practice coaching, 32 of them. I took a little bit out of each one of them, developed my own style, and basically we want to make it easy for you. Uh, our preeminence mentoring is a good fit for everybody. It enables you to become top level, rapid, efficient patient response with scientific medicine found in medical literature, become a nerve and biochemistry expert. I want to get you to where anything, a patient coming in, some situation in your practice uh, with uh, associates or with employees or anything that comes up, uh, testifying in court, writing narratives, uh, you name it, we, we want to make it easy for you. We want, want it so that when something presents itself, your mind goes to, okay, this thing first, this second, this third, this fourth, okay? Get for referrals from everywhere. I've gotten, I've seen patients from all 50 states and 97 countries. I average 640 new patient calls per month for years. There's no reason you can't do that too. I mean, you've seen me stumble and bumble around here. I, I talk with monotone. Uh, I'm certainly not a David Singer guy. I don't have that big explosive personality. My, my practice was several times bigger than his ever was. Get paid what you're worth, low stress and family time. Others committed. Now you need to commit. Just close your eyes and imagine the business of your dreams, smooth running, plenty of highly satisfied and enthusiastic patients, as many as you want or can handle, financial security, time to enjoy with your family, time to exercise regularly, great health, all those things. Three reasons it works for you. You'll devote the effort, time, and dedication to get what you want. Charisma definitely is not necessary. Group or one-on-one -on -one mentoring is very affordable. Your next step to be superlative Commit to it. Go to the link ttapcenter.com. Choose a mentoring level that fits you. Commit to change your life. First one, first level is 12-month group mentoring. One group or call uh, per week for 12 months. $250 per month or one payment of $2,500. Save $500. So it's... Uh, one call, that's 52 calls for an hour each. And you get to listen to questions from other people, other doctors. I tell them how to handle it. You can ask your questions. You get a big group interaction there. If in the first three months you decide to go to one-year one-on-one mentorship, you get the benefits of that as well. Next step is six-month one-on-one mentoring. So it's one-on-one, -on -one, just you and me, for 26 one-hour calls one a week, talk about anything to do in your practice whatsoever. I cover what's on your ra radar first. I'm not going to try to make you into my practice. I want you to have the type of practice that you want, as you saw in those testimonials. That's what those doctors like about what I'm doing. I'm not trying to make them into what my practice is and was. I want them to have the, the ideal practice that they want. If you decide to step up to the one year one on one mentorship in the first three months, you'll get all of those benefits. Now, the one year one on one, you get 52 calls for an hour each. It's a thousand a month or one payment of eight thousand. 
saves four thousand. The six month is a thousand a month, or one payment of four thousand saves two thousand. Okay. Uh, after I get finished with these films, I'm going to create a link that can be put on your website for each class. So four different links. And I have thousands of patient and doctor testimonials. That, that way when you're tell, telling people, hey, I've attended this wonderful course, TTAPS, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do all this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now you'll be able to send them to that link say go on there and then they'll be able to click on a given symptom it'll go right to it and patients telling how they improved with it and doctors telling how their patients improved with it now it's not just you saying it it's a bunch of other ones a lot more powerful that's even if you don't sign up for the mentoring you can still get that for fifty dollars a month per category okay well worth it when i did this on my own uh, site I got fifth uh, for each site I got 20 new patients per month that had never been in before and I directed my own patients to go there and read it and I said you know look on there and patients were saying I didn't know you could do that I need to re-up I need to come in for this other one and I got an average of 20 patient re-ups every month so essentially uh, 160 new patients a month from putting that on my website. So it's very, very powerful, well worth the money. Then we're gonna set up a doctor's blog where you can interact with other doctors. Say, you know, I don't know what to do with this. You know, what do you think I should do? Or I did this and this is what I used. Not only will it show TTAPs, but the doctors in their own experience from other things that they're doing. So there's even a multiplicative effect on that very powerful and that's only fifty dollars each per month or if you're in the one year mentoring you get those those for both for free we talk about anything that you want any aspect that you want one-on-one -on -one for a full year and if you want to re-up for another year it's just half the price virtually everybody who did the full year wanted to keep on going and uh you know they didn't uh, they didn't believe how much their practices had grown and their acumen. And I will tell you that one of the big things about it, nobody else doing practice mentoring or coaching or, uh, or nobody else doing mentoring, uh, practice management or coaching or any of that, developed their own techniques. I'm the only one that did, okay? And they love asking, well, I, I'm hung up on this patient. How would you take care of it? I say, okay, well, let's start out. Yeah, what have you already done? Okay, let's try this, this, and this, in this order. Okay? And they really love that aspect of it. So you need to commit now to dream, uh, to achieve your dream practice. Business results depend on your effort and effort and following directions. So you got to lose your excuses, take consistent action. Probably the only thing that separates me from you is I decide to do something, I just go for it right now. I don't wait forever to do it, okay? Even doing these seminars, I decided to start doing part one. I wrote the whole curricula in a day. Then I decided to write two. That one took about a day and a half. Uh, then part three, about a day and a half. Then part four took about a week because it's so much longer, but I already had all the information. I just need to put it down. Uh, you know, you need to just take action. If you want something, you need to determine what you want and go for it. That's the only way that you're going to get it. If you'll do this, sign up. If not, don't sign up. It's easy as that. Uh, I, I give you the information and encouragement. You're the one that has to take action to improve your life. Just as easy as that. you got to take action. Okay, now, now we have a question and answer. Uh, okay, the seminar schedule right now is uh, only part one in Texas. Uh, David, you went on the site. Uh, right after Texas, I'm going to be doing Minnesota for three weeks, and that'll be going up uh, probably next week. I'll put that on there. I have not set any part two, three, or fours yet. Okay, so that's not up there yet. Does anybody have any questions 
before we end it for the night. We're right at one and a half hours, so we're right on time tonight. Anybody have any questions over anything that we covered? Now, if not, if you want to, okay, I was tying to see you. I was tying, I don't know what tying means, David. I was tying to see you. Does that mean trying the acupressure? Okay, yeah, that's this weekend and then in El Paso, the last weekend uh, in Texas would be weekend after this one, okay? That's the acupuncture, acupressure seminar. So this weekend in Dallas, if you want to sign up, call me tonight or call me tomorrow. We can get you signed up. Uh, otherwise, you can go to El Paso. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, feel free to call me. Again, here is my email. Here is my phone number. And thank you for... Uh, attending and we will see you next week. Thank you so much.